I'm going to be talking about opening scholarship and I'm going to be talking as an academic in an institution. So it's, it's not theoretical. Some of the things I'm going to be saying are a little bit abstract, but really I'm trying to consider what this actually means for us working institutions as, in institutions as academics. And we know that these kinds of changes are complex. We've been hearing it for the last day and I'm going to try and unpick in what ways they are complex and, and how we can actually think about what's happening to us and make sure that we have agency and take control of what, what's going on. And my focus is going to be on content and communication in particular. And I'm wondering how many people here saw the introduction to the Olympics, the, that wonderfully British, um, slightly esoteric view of... Yeah, how many people? Can you put up your hands? Okay, so did you notice, that's, that's pretty much most people here, did you notice that Tim Berners-Lee was brought out as a national British figure, of which everyone's very proud? And I was very struck by that. There's this lone man with his computer in the middle of this very vast stadium. And only 25 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee, 25 years ago, that is not long. How many people in this room were not born 25 years ago? <laughs> were not born 25 years ago? <laughs> Fess up. <laughs> Only 25 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee wrote a proposal to his boss at CERN for something called the mesh. And he said, we really can't keep on in, in control of all the content and information that we use in our projects at CERN and I think we need a new system. And his boss said, that sounds vague, but exciting. And that is what brought us to the World Wide Web. And that underpins all the discussions we're having today. It's extraordinary, no wonder we're terrified. It's incredibly new. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the affordances of the technology and how content can, and communication have changed, and then lead into what that means for us as scholars. Huge changes, actually, profound changes. The first profound change is that copying content is easy and free. This is very different from the past, where it was complicated, difficult and expensive. Now, we might not like that, we might not be comfortable with the consequences of it, but that is how it is. Numerous files can be copied easily and speedily, and that really is a fundamental shift. Speed is no longer a problem. If we think of um, textbooks, Getting textbooks from A to B, a matter very close to our hearts here in South Africa. The difficulties of moving textbooks, using the conventional systems. In a digital age, this really doesn't have to be an issue. And it suggests a complete rethink of textbook provision, for example, although that's not my focus today. Critically, profoundly, sharing changes meaning. I think sharing's always been a, a consideration for educators because it's really the basis of what we do as educators and academics. But what we do sharing digitally is quite different because sharing now means multiplying, not dividing. And if you stop for a moment to think of what that actually means. If you have a book, and I give Paul the book, I don't have it anymore. Or I take it and I break it in half. It's divided. In the digital age, I have the book and I can give the book to Paul, although, although the publishers are doing their dandest to try and make sure I can't. Actually, the technology makes it possible very easily for me to give 
the book to Paul. And I think this is actually a losing battle for publishers, and I speak as an ex-publisher. And I think that publishers really do have to get their heads around the fact that the technology affords sharing. That is a deeply embedded practice. The music industry has already had to make its peace with that. And in the scholarly domain, it's changing the way scholarly communication happens. It also means that we can share and broadcast. So I can give something to Paul and share the fact that I'm doing so with all of you, on Twitter, for example. And that also changes the way that uh, communication and content happens. Another interesting dimension is that content is device agnostic, increasingly so. So at the moment, the book and the content can only exist in this form. We are all increasingly expecting content to pop up on our iPads, our phones, our laptops, our desktops. And that is actually going to become the norm. I mean, I'm not one for great predictions, but I think these are the kinds of practices that are really the way things are going. And finally, and very importantly for academics and academia, content can be changed, annotated, commented on, linked, updated. So in other words, content is now dynamic. And that's also a profound change, and it's a, it in fact has huge potential consequences for uh, the way that we publish as academics, as scholars. It, it affects the entire journal process, potentially. What about communication? You know, when, when we moved from an oral to a written age, it was a profound change. In fact, there was a wonderful story, I don't know if anybody here ever read Walter Ong, who spoke about in the, um, the age when literacy became predominant as a practice, the courts refused to accept written documents because they said written documents lie and they were adamant they wanted people there so they could assess whether they were lying or not. It was a profound shift. Now we've got another shift happening which is that communication is becoming visible. When people are talking on BBM, are they talking or are they writing? Online chat is a new form, it's a new practice. And that changes the way that we do our work as scholars. So communication becomes content. I don't know if any of you at the moment are reading Paul's fabulous critical blog where he's been commenting on uh, criticizing in a very thoughtful way the uh, learning analytics and uh, data terrain. And the comments are in, at the moment as interesting as the original blog. That conversation is now part of the content. I think everyone's heard of the, the concept of the read-write web. The assumption that when you engage with content, you can comment. So when I read this book, I want to write on it, but I want to write on it in a way that starts a conversation that everyone else can participate in. And when there is an online version, I imagine we will be able to do just that. And of course, as we've heard repeatedly through the conference, um, social media is a new form of communication and it is a new form of communication and we're still working out what that means for scholarship. And what that all adds up to is, is that scholars have opportunities for new forms of influence. And at the end of the day, as scholars, I think that's why we're in this business. We want to influence, we want to make a change, we want to contribute. I don't think any of us are in it for the money. <laughs> and the new terrain offers us new ways of contributing and of influencing. So having described these key affordances, I'm going to look at scholarship itself and, and consider how these affordances are playing out at the moment 
um, in, in the scholarly terrain. Here's a very familiar image to us all. It's the scholarly process. It's what we do, all of us. We're all involved in scholarship that includes conceptualization. When we do research, data collection and analysis, we all land up with some findings. And I'm saying this across the disciplines. It takes different forms. It's obviously discipline specific. And then we're involved with translating those findings in different ways to our students and to the broader community, to society, and engaging with society. I think that those are generic phases that everyone in every discipline is involved in and can recognize. Some of you will be familiar with Boyer's concepts of scholarship, um, the professoriate uh, reconsidered. And Boyer reminds us that all of those dimensions are forms of scholarship. I think this is very important because one tends to assume that scholarship is only the research discovery phase. And he argues very persuasively that scholarship is actually the whole business. So, of course, the scholarship of discovery that we recognize as research is important. But the scholarship of engagement, engaging with the community, engaging with uh, policy makers, how we do that, how we take the, the research findings, translate them, use them, um, etc., is also a form of scholarship. And very importantly, for all of us involved with teaching and committed teachers, the scholarship of teaching and learning is critical. The last form of scholarship he mentions is this, the scholarship of integration, which is across disciplines and across time particularly useful and important for us when we're thinking about these digital issues. <coughs> this is what the situation looks like to date, conventionally, with the types of content associated with the different phases of scholarship. We can all see ourselves there, we can all see the work there, we can all see the work on our desktops there, I think. And what I'm going to do is, is run through how things are changing at every stage and how those audiences are changing because it tends to be that at different stages you talk to different communities. And I tend to think of scholar to scholar, scholar to student, scholar to community as quite distinct, and, and we're starting to see a blurring of those audiences as well. To go back to my earlier point, because communication is becoming content, this massive shift of the communication overlay is really the thing that's changing the, the, the way things work. All of those um, those bits of content that we have on our desktops are now overlaid with conversations, with annotations, with communication, with tweets, with blogs, that are, as I mentioned, content too. So where are your literature reviews at the moment? On your desktop, somewhere, private, unshared? started a research project and wished that you could access someone else's literature review, you know that people have done this before. But you can't because they're not generally shared. And they're private. What's starting to happen is that people are starting to share their literature reviews. And they're sharing them using a whole range of new tools such as Delicious and Site You Like and Mendeley and sometimes Dropbox and a variety of tools. And they're making those literature reviews available. Efficient, collaborative, sustainable, sensible, attributable, very useful and quite different in fact as a new and emergent practice. Here's an example of Mendeley. This is uh, 
a tool I'm increasingly finding useful, which provides you a wonderfully integrated reference management system, as well as a community, as well as the ability to comment, to highlight, and to read from different places. Incredibly useful, and the more people, of course, who use it, the more it grows scholarly communi communities. What about data? How many people, you don't have to put your hands up, but just think, how many people have your data on your various projects at the moment in digital form at all? Increasingly, data will be in digital form. And in fact, it's quite likely that it will be required to be in digital form. And it's quite likely that something we will have to add to our list of tasks is a data management plan. Something funders are starting to ask for, and it's a good thing the head of the library is, is, is here, because I suspect she will be asked for advice on this very issue. So data has tended to be something that gets lost, perhaps on a hard drive somewhere. Um, somebody leaves, the data goes with them. Not able to be checked, not able to be verified. When it's reported on, it's reported on in a summary. You can't actually see whether the academic's data says what they say it says. Um, not able to be replicated. And that's changing profoundly and quite scarily to go back to my, quest my, point about, uh, my opening point about contestation. This is actually quite scary because it also means that rubbish data gets exposed. There's an element of transparency that is linked to what's happening with changes in data. This is one of the areas of the most profound change. In fact, curated data, shareable data, mineable data. So data sets that can be used and collected and shared and reused. There's a wonderful story about the, the Human Genome Project. I'm not sure if anybody uh, knows the story, but there were two initiatives when the Human Genome Project was being undertaken, and one of them made all the data available, and one of them didn't. And the project that made all the data available had far more impact, far more outputs, and generated far more money and jobs than the one that didn't. So the, the power of sharing data is not insignificant. We're hearing a lot about big data. Exciting, threatening, terrifying. Not a solution, of course. We still need people, us, to interpret the big data, to ask the questions, to make sense of it. But it's there and it's not going away. These are some of the quite frightening things that we are having to deal with. Crowdsourcing. So the power relations around data collection are changing. To date, scholars have been the only people who have the authority to collect data. With crowdsourcing, members of the community are collecting data and giving it to academics to analyze and synthesize. A profound shift in power relations, in fact. Here are a couple of examples. Figshare is a site where people are putting their data sets. And what's interesting about it is that as soon as the data sets are published, are uploaded, they are made available. Speed. They are given a DOI, which is a digital object identifier. Which means, as soon as you have a DOI, that data set can be named and found. Because if 
something gets put online, it's got to be discoverable. And so a DOI is required. You can put your data sets up today on Figshare. It's free. What's also inter interesting about, in fact, uh, Figshare doesn't only host data sets, but it's, it's the main thing that it, it hosts. One of the things I found interesting about Figshare as a matter of interest is that I had a look to see who was behind Figshare. Who are the, the people and the stakeholders in the scholarly game nowadays? Because these are now new players in the scholarly game. And we're, we're playing in their space. And they're playing in ours. Figshare is owned by something called digital science. And when I scratched a bit further, I saw that digital science is owned by Macmillan. And I thought that was very interesting because Macmillan is reinventing itself. Macmillan is clearly letting go of the idea that it's going to make money from our content and is creating technological frameworks. I'm not sure what the publishing model for Figshare is, it's free, but of course you can buy storage. And that's something I'm going to come back to later. Because I think the costs of storage are going to be critical for scholars. And the providers of storage are going to be the ones who start to have the power. When they can't own our copyrights, they can provide us with storage. Dryad is another interesting example where journals have collaborated to provide data spaces. Um, I seem to think, yeah, 147 journals. And in particular in the science, there's an expectation, a growing expectation from scientists around access to data in the name of good, honest, authentic, reliable verifiable science. And so Dryad is a well-established, well-curated data space. And if you publish in one of those journals, you will be expected to provide your data in a, in a form um, that, where it will be taken care of in, in Dryad. As I mentioned, we're seeing crowdsourcing and the rise of citizen science. Here's an example from the University of Cape Town where the um, animal demography unit uses lay scientists, to use the term, to collect data and obviously collect a great deal more data than they would possibly be able to do otherwise. It seems to be particularly um, uh, popular in, in the zoologies and the natural sciences perhaps because it lends itself, uh, it's more amenable to that kind of data collection. You've noticed that I've spoken about the sciences largely and it's true that many of these innovations and new practices are emerging in the sciences. But there is starting to be more activity in the humanities and the term digital humanities is becoming much more prevalent and it's quite fascinating because it's bringing together academics who had not previously worked together. Historians and computer scientists, archaeologists and information systems, academics, etc. And they are looking at large data sets curating huge archives, engaging in text mining in ways that simply could not be done before. After yesterday's uh, keynote, George Siemens I, and I had a long conversation about what's really new. Haven't people always been perceiving patterns? Isn't that always what we've been done in academia? What are the things that are really new? And this is really new. It wasn't possible previously to have a project with 52,000 quilts over four centuries 
and analyze the patterns across countries, across time, and synthesize the findings and interpret by academics what that actually means about history and humanity. A most fascinating project and a wonderful example of the kinds of work that we can now do as academics in the humanities. Right, we all know what a, a, an output looks like. We all get uh, reviewed on them. They are journal articles in journals on paper on an ISI listed journal. Three lists, South Africans, mostly South Africans here. We know what it looks like. It's a very clear form. It's stable, it's final, it's the version that you finally decide to publish and put up. But that's changing too. The outputs themselves are now dynamic and multimodal and multimedia. New kinds of articles. Let's just stay with articles because, of course, there's another whole discussion about articles per se. But let's just stay with articles. Those articles are now what's been called enhanced publications with links directly through to references. We're even starting to expect those, that you click through to the reference. Obviously, with metadata, clicking through to actual images, not photographs, but the actual images, and to video. So if people are writing about interviews, there is now the easy possibility that you can click through to a video of that interview. Here's one example of many a psychology journal where you can click through to the data, you can click through, sorry, the image isn't very clear. Um, you can click through to an interview, really using the affordances of the new technology to create a different kind of article. Not even that astonishing. Quite a lot of implications for us, especially for those of us who are journal editors and those of us who want to grow South African journal publishing because it is a new type of publishing. However, the journals themselves are changing because there's really no need in quite the same way to have these types of distinct journals. In fact, some people would even suggest that the notion of peer review in the form that we have it to date is not really necessary. And the Public Library of Science was really the groundbreaker in introducing a new form of peer review that takes cognizance of the new environment. And so they have two levels or types of peer review. And the first they call technical peer review. And all that happens at that level is that a piece of research or an output is assessed for methodological soundness. Is this actually well done? Is this valid? Have, they, have, have the researchers used solid research methods? Is this rep replicable? All the, the good things that are sensible. But that peer review stage doesn't include any comment on value or influence. So that expert statement, and we all know, we've all had reviewers pronouncing judgment on our work that we know is, not inac is, is inaccurate, we know is not fair. So that level is actually removed at the outset. So the first level of peer review simply says this is actually fair enough to publish. Then the articles go online, allowing for engagement, a lot of engagement and feedback from a wide group of people before authors can decide on what they then consider to be the version of publication. The other interesting thing about the Public Library of Science, for example, is that PLOS One is also breaking down disciplinary differences. And in fact, we're seeing potentially the rise of mega journals. So it's across the biological sciences, not simply one uh, of the sciences. 
serious implications for disciplinarity in an age of cross and transdisciplinarity too. Okay, something very close to our hearts. Textbooks, textbook provision. We know about textbooks, we know how expensive they are. But we also know that even in the online learning environment space at the moment, digital resources are only available to those students who have access to login courses. And I think it's quite an important distinction to make between digital and open. Digital enables open, but it also enables closed. And of course that's one of the uh, very important things about books and one of the dangers. Because at the moment, a publisher can make this book available in an e-version and then can stop that availability. You license it onto your Kindle, it can disappear from your Kindle. Books that are licensed to libraries can be licensed for use by 200 people and then disappear. Unlike a book which at the moment, once the library has bought it, owns it until it disintegrates. So let's not make the confusion between digital automatically equaling open. It enables open, but it's actually up to us. And this is once again where the questions of power and agency come into play. It's up to us to ensure that the frameworks do enable openness. And here we're seeing a massive change. The rise of open education resources, something very close to Eunice's heart. Um, the rise of videos online, the, the rise of lectures online. How many people, how many students here are using the Khan Academy? The implications of this are profound. And they're profound in a lot of different ways, and they're threatening. They make the question of the quality of um, teaching come um, under the spotlight. Because if the quality of teaching in the classroom is not of any good, students will go online and find something better. No wonder people are threatened. It's, it brings uh, the, the lens of transparency to bear to teaching in quite a, a complex way. And certainly in the work we've been doing at the University of Cape Town, when we've spoken to people about sharing their teaching resources, very often they say, I would really like to. I would like that other people can use my resources, but I don't think they're good enough. And I'm always, con I'm always confused by that, because why is it good enough for your students who are paying fees and yet not good enough to be made available free? It's a strange contradiction and it speaks to our existing quality assurance mechanisms and the support that academics as educators get, to my mind. So I think it raises a lot of issues around roles and around agency. And of course, this is something we could talk about a great deal and is the subject of much of the conference. We know that open education resources are giving rise to new types of um, textbooks, open textbooks, and new types of publishers who are publishing those new types of textbooks. Here are just a few examples of uh, places you can get open content to make open textbooks. And of course there are in, in, uh, enterprising people, I don't know if anybody's come across Boundless. Boundless assures you, you give them a textbook they will find equivalent open content and give you back the same textbook. I haven't tried it myself. How am I doing for time, by the way? I, I didn't look when I started. Okay, because I've still got a while to go. Okay, so as I was saying at the outset, we are used to clearly demarcated audiences. We know when we're talking to fellow scholars, we know when we're talking to students, we know when we're talking to policy makers and the community. But the terrain has changed because now content is available to everyone. And so we don't know in the way we used to know who is reading our content, 
how it's going to be interpreted. And in that way, as academics, we're losing control, which frightens us. This is all very frightening. However, it's also a fantastic opportunity. And here's one example of how research is going beyond scholar to scholar. And it's an example of PubMed Central, which is the repository into which scientists whose work are funded by the National Institute of Health in the US have to deposit their outputs. It's a requirement. If you get funding from the National Institute of Health, you only get it on condition you make your outputs available open access and it has to be put into the, in the, into the PubMed Central. And here is a, an analysis of who looked at and um, used the research that was published in PubMed Central in August 2012. So there were two million full text articles, 420,000 unique users, ago, of which, uh, users a day, of which 25% were universities. I think that is very interesting. Our assumption has been that we published research for other scholars. Small community, in crowd, and in fact what we're seeing in this particular instance that in 18%, 18% of the users are from government. This is very exciting. This actually provides access to government um, and informs the work that government does. 40% citizens, community, out there, health, this is all health, which means that the community is getting access to research on health, not mediated research, but the actual research. And interestingly, 17% to companies, because of course, companies innovate with research. They need that research in order to to do their work, and so they are also drawing on the research from NIH's repository. Fascinating, isn't it? All of this means that there are now new ways of measuring impact and influence. And impact has broadened in terms of what it means. We are used to impact meaning peer review, as in the middle, and we recognize impact as being citations. It's something that we, are, we take very seriously. But impact now means usage. Those downloads from the NIH's repository is a form of impact. It isn't on our performance reviews yet, but surely it will be. Surely it must be. Surely we must be demanding that it is. And we're seeing the rise of the altmetrics world. Links bookmarks, conversations, new forms of influence, which are now being measured in new ways. There's the summary. Are you terrified? The thing is, if we don't understand this, it is going to be done to us. And I think if there's one message I have, it is let it not be done to us. We have to understand this. We have to actually grapple with what it means for us and for our agendas. Otherwise, we're going to wake up one day and find the ground has compl completely shifted between, beneath our feet and we don't know how that happened. I just want to mention very, very briefly the rise of open research, which is a very um, active movement in the sciences and it relates to the points that I have been mentioning where the processes, not the content, but the processes are becoming open and expected to become open. Where scientists are demanding that research is replicable, reusable, replayable. Critical very important and obviously feeds directly into this conversation. So not the, the subject of the talk, but something I could not mention. In short, in this 
landscape business as usual has come to a dead end. It is coming to a dead end. We're so busy trying to get through the days that we might not notice that this is happening. And openness is rising all around us. Open practices are pretty much mainstream. I'm always nervous about what's the real definition of mainstream and I don't like those kinds of glib statements. But there is no question that there is a plethora of activity and scholarly practices, and I'm particularly interested in the scholarly ones, in which open practices are in fact becoming mainstream. But perhaps even more important is that the policy landscape is changing globally. And this is something that's very new. We, I started off saying 25 years ago was new. I'm talking about the last six months. And we haven't, we're so busy trying to keep up with the latest issues. We, I don't think we've even begun to understand what the changes globally in the policy landscape actually mean for us in the global south. And it's something we're going to have to get our heads around because funders globally are mandating open access and open scholarship. We're talking about the big um, worldwide organizations like UNESCO and the World Bank. I don't know if any of you have been to the World Bank sites lately, but everything the World Bank produces, including its data, is now available open access for all of us to use. That's an extraordinary shift. And I've heard people from the World Bank talking about the implications, financial, the losses and the gains. Massive gain for scholarship. But closer to us is that the European Commission has now announced that all European Commission funded research has to be made available open access. That's billions of dollars and euros of funding and that affects us. We get EU funding too. We haven't even begun to consider, except for perhaps our librarian here who knows that this is going to actually affect what we do with our data and our outputs. The UK science minister recently through the Finch report has announced the same decision, all UK funding. All the, U the UK research councils, all seven of them, have made the same announcement. The European Medical Research Councils differed, from whom many of us get funding too. Spain, Denmark, Brazil. You will notice South Africa is not on that list. However, our Minister of Science and Technology has spoken out very clearly in favour of openness. And this is a very encouraging sign, because of course open research is a massive contribution to development and this is one of the final points I want to make, is that there is a tension between the development imperative and other imperatives. And the, our Minister of Science and Technology understands the open access imperative, but we haven't got to the point yet where our behaviour has to change through funding frameworks. And of course, money speaks. Money is a driver. These recent initiatives in different parts of the world will change behavior. It's not a matter of change management. It's not a matter of uh, practices. It's a matter of financial drivers. OK. A bit worried about time. OK. So I'm not going to go into detail in, in too much detail about, about all the issues. I'm going to run through some of them a little bit more quickly than others. Infrastructure, 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 and infrastructure. And then after that again, infrastructure. Without the infrastructure, we are out of the digital space. We are out of the networks. We are out of the knowledge sharing space. We are out of the knowledge collaboration and contribution spaces. And one of the ironic 
dangers of all of this fabulous open access work that's coming from the global north is that there is a danger that every time we press a Google search we will only find research from the global north because they are now mandated to make everything available online. And although I'm sure that much of the work from the global north is going to be very useful to us, I fear that much of it will not be. And so we have a serious obligation to ensure that our work is made available online and that we have the infrastructure to do so. So it's actually becoming an imperative, not a nice to have, it's actually a condition of contribution. Tools, well, something we've been talking about all the way. Skills, critical. I was very pleased to hear yesterday somebody else talking about the critical nature of curation. We're all going to have to become curators, whether we like it or not, a term that we weren't even thinking about two years ago. And of course, critical literacies, it's really frightening. How do you engage with text if you don't even have a stable version anymore? What does that mean for the way you read something and what does that mean for our students? It's a complex ball game now. And to stress the point that I've been making repeatedly, creation and contribution. Can I ask one last, this is the last time I'm going to ask you anything. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with my last few slides of comments. How many people here have contributed to Wikipedia? Okay, four or five. The last time I asked an audience, nobody had. So that's, that's an improvement on last week. But, of course, Wikipedia is the number one site people go to for their first round of information. We can say, we're academics, we don't like Wikipedia. Live with it. It's there. And the one fantastic thing about it is that we can improve the quality of Wikipedia. If we don't like the rubbish they write about Africa, let's write the truth. Let's fix it. We have to become knowledge contributors. We can't complain about someone else anymore. There's a very interesting initiative in the health sector where medical profession, professionals have actually got together. It's medical professionals and Wikipedia because they're so worried about how much um, patients take information from Wikipedia that they're ensuring that the information on Wikipedia is accurate. And I actually believe that we have an obligation to engage with Wikipedia. This is my current theme song. Okay, so I'm going to end with trying to just quite quickly highlight the areas of critical contestations. Because one of the scary things, when t one of the things that worries me when people talk about technology is they make it sound very sort of simple and nice. And, you know, they're these nice new tools. And, Let's just learn to use them. Of course, it's actually complicated and frightening, and there are vested interests in us behaving in certain ways, and there are people who are going to lose out. You know, Houghton Mifflin, which is the biggest textbook publisher in the US, has just gone bankrupt. I thought that was equivalent to Kodak going bankrupt. That was such a profound signal of changes in the environment, in the educational environment. They didn't adapt to the changing terrain. So, as I've been saying, the rules of the game are changing. Um, the whole terrain is much more dynamic and we have to see it as an ecology. I think it's really important that when we, and that's why I like to talk about open scholarship, when we talk about open education resources, we can't only talk about open education resources because it links to so many other aspects of the ecology. It links to what's going on in the open access space. It links to the underpinnings around open licensing. It's related to what's going on in the research space. We have to understand the, the opening terrain as an ecology. And there are serious contestations around rules, roles, values, incentives, rewards and funding. And for us that means that we are living that tension. Already, we might not know that we are, but we are. 
And I, I'm summarizing, I'm suggesting that, that, that it's a tension between prestige and development. Because universities want, for very understandable reasons, prestige. They want to say we have so many scholars with so many outputs in the right journals. It's a particular form of recognition that is actually in tension, in, in, in tension, two words, with the development imperative and the opportunities for influence that in fact many of us are already engaging with and not being recognized for. It creates a real tension. There's another tension which I alluded to earlier, which is around the global knowledge relations. Because of course those journals as they stand in the global north have a view of knowledge where in fact Northern knowledge is presumed to be universal knowledge. They don't really mean universal. They mean of interest to the global north. And we have an opportunity now to contest that because we are actually able to make available our own research. We have the tools in ways we simply didn't have before and we are actually able to contest those existing systems. Which is about voice, it's about authority, it's about much deeper matters. For students, of course, there's serious contestation because of the disaggregation of content, pedagogy, um, and accreditation. All those issues that uh, George Siemens was talking about yesterday. Complex and critical. Great opportunities for many students if they have access to what Bourdieu calls cultural capital. So it's not just about technological capital. And there's actually a danger that these opening spaces will open for the elite. And I think that's something that's a matter of great concern to all of us, that these opening spaces don't actually exacerbate divides. Even those of us with the very best intentions. So I think we do have a responsibility to understand this terrain, to ensure that students can participate. You, you know I've mentioned publishers, and I want to repeat that I'm an ex-publisher, and I feel very strongly about the importance of publishing skills, but can we please separate publishing skills and publishing activities from commercial publishers? They tend to be conflated, they're not the same thing. But I do think we have to ask the question of what we need commercial publishers for. We used to need them as distributors. We used to need them to provide publishing skills. I think we have to ask the question, do we still need them? Should we be looking at scholarly publishing as an inst Should we be reclaiming the scholarly communication and research dissemination space? And you can be sure that there will be many voices and many interests who will tell us, of course, we don't need to do that. But I think that, in fact, we, we can. And it's a conversation I believe we should be having. And it's actually underpinned by, and this is my last point, the question of intellectual property. It's underpinned by who owns our knowledge. Why are we giving away our knowledge? At the moment, we're giving it away to distribu distributors. And obviously, this is not the space to talk about it, but open licenses are not a, just a technical matter. They're actually a matter of agency. They're actually a matter of saying, we own our knowledge, and we are licensing it to you to use and share under certain conditions. Very important. And so my very last slide, I promise you, Paul is my argument that we really need to be seeing knowledge as a commons. And this is not a, a, a flippant term, it comes from a, a lot of literature where a commons is a resource that's shared by a group of people. A global commons. And the notion of the commons in the literature is underpinned by three key principles that we need to be engaging with, I believe, which are equity, efficiency, and sustainability. And that should be the way that we have this conversation. And I think that would bring us back to the basics of what we do as academics in universities, which is 
taking care of curating knowledge creation and dissemination. Thanks very much. Good morning, colleagues. Um, in my language, a combination of a C and a Z and an E is kind of difficult to pronounce. So, Professor, I'll just call you Professor Laura. That's much, much easier for me. Um, I think I join everybody uh, in this room in saying this was um, not only exciting, but I think it was also frightening intellectually, because I think for most of us, what's frightening is what I'm calling uh, the changing role of the academic and the changing role of the student and the changing issues of power. As an academic, I used to have power and that power was power based on my knowledge which obviously was certified on a piece of paper that says a master's degree or a PhD. But now that is changing because I'm no longer the source of knowledge. The student now has other sources of knowledge and the student now even has an opportunity to be able to interpret that knowledge much better than I can interpret that knowledge. So for me, that's the source of the fear in terms of the changing landscape of academia, the changing landscape, and one may say just tertiary education, or the changing landscape of A, knowledge construction, B, knowledge uh, storage, and C, how that knowledge gets disseminated, and D, how that knowledge gets used for certain purposes, in particular, the purposes of creating other forms of knowledge. So, uh, Professor, uh, you, you, you kind of scared me from where I was sitting because um, of the kinds of things uh, that, that you said. But I think the second thing that I think is important that, uh, that prof the, the Professor talked about is that it is important for us to share knowledge. Um, I've also read the, the literature on the genome project from the new scientist, and I agree with you that I think the more we share, obviously first and foremost, the more people get to know what we do, the more people get to know what even this institution stands for. But the more we share, the more we put our knowledge out there so that other people can use that knowledge for other purposes and for purposes that we never would even have imagined in the first instance. And obviously you said they even made more money. So I think it is important for us to, to talk about sharing. I think the, the third point I want to mention, which I got from the, from the talk, is that this changing landscape of teaching and learning and research, the changing landscape of publishing. What it has done is that it is beginning to bring about different communities. Etienne Wenger calls them communities of practice. But I think it is bringing about different communities within academia. We are now seeing communities of academics. We are now seeing communities of researchers. We are now seeing communities of students. We are now seeing communities that are even made up of people that are outside the institution. But what that does is, what that does is, it makes knowledge go onto the doorstep of literally everybody else out there. And, and I liked what you said, especially the example you brought um, uh, from the United States, where even people in government are now using the knowledge that we produce. One of the major criticisms that some of us make about uh, government bureaucrats is that they don't want to use the knowledge we produce but I think with this changing landscape that information is there right in front of them at the click of a button and what we're beginning to see is that they are actually now using using uh, that, that knowledge. You talked about new kinds of articles with new links and I think this is what I find I find uh, fascinating 
But one thing you didn't talk about, uh, Professor, is that for every single one of us sitting in this room, when you open up an article that has got these links, the danger is, instead of marking your assignments <laughs> and talking to your students, you spend hours and hours. I was communicating with Paul Prinstow early this morning. He sent me something. And I did the mistake of opening one of the articles. <laughs> and then I went on and on to the links to the metadata. And I realized, oh boy, I have to go to work. So I think, I, th I think what's happening and what we need to look into is that they are now changing conceptions of what is time. I think the notion of time has been collapsed. The notion of distance has been collapsed. There's no place that's far away because I can get it right in front of me. So for me, that too is frightening. I find it extremely uh, frightening. The, the fifth point that you mentioned, I'm a general editor, and I find it frightening the changes that are out there in terms of the new kinds of journals that are coming up. And, and you ask a very important question. Uh, I'll ask this question because I know that Professor Makanya or Professor Satati are not here. <laughs> should, should we now do away with Taylor and Francis? I think that's much more than a contestation. That's much more than a tension. It goes to the heart of what he talked much later in terms of the core mod modification of knowledge. And that people or publishers like Macmillan have now transformed themselves. They're actually moving much faster. By the way, I've worked for Hutton Nif Nifflin before. But I think what Macmillan has done and what Taylor and Francis are doing is to move much, much faster than most of us. And I think in your talk, as you spoke, I said there's one issue that you're not talking about. And Bill Gates has wrote about it long time ago, business at the speed of thought. That what did we do in academia? Because for us to be able to cope with this changing environment, with this changing landscape, the notion of the speed with which we read, the speed with which we assimilate, the speed with which we interpret, the speed with which we reuse knowledge is frightening. And where do I get those kinds of skills? I got my PhD 40 years ago. Where do I get those kinds of skills? And how do I get those kinds of skills? I'm sure my colleagues at UNISA would have, would have an answer. You talked again, I think, of a topic that's very close to most of our hearts, the issue of textbooks and digital resources and what they're able to do. But again, and, and I'm glad you talked about it yourself, that inherent in all this, there's the issue of power. Because knowledge is power. And the distribution of that knowledge. And I'm so glad you use the notion of the commons. Those of us who have done or are doing Economics 101, we know the definition of the commons in Economics 101. But inherent in that de definition of the commons in Economics 101, and indeed in other definitions, is not only just issues of access, equity, quality, etc., but there are issues of choice and issues of market. In fact, what is happening, and I completely agree with you, what other people are doing out there is to reinvent the nature of the market. I completely agree with you that UNESCO, that the World Bank, that DFID, and everybody else is putting their knowledge out there. The question I've always asked for a, for a person who works for UNESCO and who has worked for the World Bank is what are the interests inherent in all this? Are they giving us this information because they want us to use this information? And, and, and the, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a natural scientist, but the information that some of us are interested in is information in medicine, information in agriculture, especially in crop science for us on the African continent. 
I was told that long time ago, the Americans, they do have the knowledge about a particular seed of corn or maize that is so drought resistant that we can use on the African continent, but they're not prepared to give us. Why? Because it would affect the market, especially the corn producer in the Midwest in the United States. So the issues of knowledge and power are critical. I would just, I took copious notes, but I just want to end, I just want to end my commentary on, on the five key issues that, that you mentioned. I think there's one issue that is missing from infrastructure tools, skills, critical literacies, creation and contribution, etc. I think there's one, one key issue that is missing. That key issue is for those of us who are in positions of management, and that key issue is our changing attitudes. Our changing attitudes about how we manage the new landscape. Our changing attitudes about how we create an enabling environment. I work with a minister with an MEC of education in one province, and I won't mention which province is that. <laughs> that MEC, for his senior management, every single one of them will get an iPad. Infrastructure is important, but I think attitudes in terms of how we make use of that infrastructure to create an enabling environment so that academics can empower themselves to be able to use the knowledge that's available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. The, the, the other issue that you didn't mention, you mentioned it later on when you were talking, is, is, is the issue of cost, is the issue of cost. I'm in the field of education. For most of our teachers to be able to take a small portion from their small salaries to pay for bandwidth and connectivity is problematic. So the issue of cost in terms of that infrastructure becomes critical. We need to create opportunities so that our students, so that our academics have access to those tools out there so that they can be able to use, reuse, create, recreate that knowledge which is out there. I'm very impressed by the issue of critical literacies. As, as a doctoral supervisor like most of you in this room, one of the challenges we have is how do you develop critical literacies in a student? I'm finding it extremely difficult. And what makes it difficult for me, what makes it difficult for me, unlike my friend Paul Prinzlow, who probably speaks Afrikaans as his first language, and you didn't, you didn't talk about this unless I missed it, is, is, is that for most of us, language becomes a critical tool, it becomes a critical skill that we need to be able to access this knowledge. It is there, but we need to be able to read it. We need to be able to read it critically. We need to have, we need to have that skill to be able to say, this knowledge is not for me. This knowledge is not universal. Because you say it in many ways, although differently, that the language we use to access knowledge, that language, is not ours. And for most of us, I need, first of all, to shift gears in my mind so that I'm able to cognitively understand what I'm reading. So I, I agree with you, but I think the issue of language is, is, is critical. I think, I think you touched our hearts to say we should not continue to criticize the people that have produced Wikipedia. We should also contribute so that we do not consume what we do not produce. So that we begin to be key players in the global knowledge, hegemonic discourses. Because there is that hegemony, and, and I agree with what you say, that universal knowledge is universal knowledge from the perspective of the producer. But for those of us in the global south, and I don't know whether we can use the term global south, uh, but for those of us in the south, 
we need to be able to prepare ourselves so that at least we can we can be able to produce knowledge that becomes oppositional to that discourse that's coming from Europe, North America, etc. Uh, colleagues, I think I cannot do justice uh, to this to this. I think very fascinating and one may dare say groundbreaking uh, presentation. But I think uh, what I want to say is if you are out there and you haven't made the bold leap to give yourself the skills to be able to make use of the changing landscape of higher education which has been brought about by the creation of knowledge at such speed and in such large quantities, the time is now. Thank you. Because you brought an energy into this room that very few people are able to do, and I'm I love the dynamic way you engage with Laura. Um, thank you so much for that very intelligent but so dynamic response. Thank you very much. With Paul's permission, could we cut our tea break by five minutes so that we can have a little bit of interaction? Is that all right for everybody? So we could have 25? Yeah. One question. Okay, you heard the boss. Or we can engage with Laura at tea. There's Chris, okay. Professor Zimbo mentioned the self-reinvention of the big commercial uh, publishers. And you asked the question whether we would still need those commercial publishers in the future. We know the answer is no. And they know the answer is no, and they've acted on that knowledge. They've reinvented themselves. Um, Pearson is aggressively moving into our domain, into our space, with even in the assessment arena. Uh, on, on the webpage, they describe themselves as the world's leading learning company. My question is, why are universities lagging behind? Why is it so difficult for us to see the writing on the wall and to act upon that? I think that's the question we all have to be asking ourselves. I don't think that I have the answer any more than anyone else does. I think the problem is we are all working really hard doing what we have to do every day and things are moving beneath our feet and I think it's these kinds of conversations and these kinds of groupings that actually have to make us take action and form groupings to, to to change things. I mean, if you look at some of the collaborative activities that happened in the states around the Research Act, where the publishers tried to close down open access, it was through academics taking action that that shifted. And I think we actually have to start doing similarly here in South Africa, becoming aware of the issues and then working together to, to take action. Now, I didn't mention the Pearson example, but it's an excellent example. And it's why I wanted to end with reminding us our, ourselves of what our core business is before it's taken over by private providers. So thank you for that.